Yoga Jones, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be a guest speaker at our School of International Relations. Not at all, very good. Okay. You were born in Wales and you lived most of your childhood and youth in Spain. Yes. Uh, in the mid-70s you were appointed Chief of Cabinet of the President of the British Conservative Party before becoming a Member of Parliament. In the 80s you were part of the British Government as Lord Commissioner of Her Majesty's Treasury, Vice Ch Chamberlain and Comte of Her Majesty's Household, and then Minister of State for the European Union. In the 90s, you left politics and decided to join the private sector. At present, you are Managing Director of UBS Investment Bank, Chairman of Latin America at UBS as well, and a member and board member of Vodafone and Acciona, as well as Vice Chairman of Canning House. Uh, how was your daily life as a pro-European British Tory politician? Well, first of all, you're quite right. I <clears throat> put behind me my criminal past as a politician and become an honest man. I'm now an investment banker. Um, but you're right. I mean, the difficulty of being pro-European in the United Kingdom, uh, because we have this underlying uh, patrioterismo, you would say in Spanish, uh, it's slightly, you're, you're accused almost of being a traitor if you don't accept the fact that the United Kingdom, like most countries in the world today, is dependent <clears throat> to a very large degree on decisions that are taken in international fora. And therefore, the, the difficulty and indeed the challenge for the European Union and for individual countries in it is to identify those areas where our values and our interests are best advanced by sharing our sovereignty with other people and keeping those areas where uh, the nation state and the values that the nation state represents, namely <coughs> sense of belonging, social cohesion and all that sort of thing, are not lost. And that's really the challenge. Um, but I'm afraid in the United Kingdom, you know, there are still many, many people because of our history in the last 100, 150 years, who haven't realized that, you know, to, the, to use the phrase, Britannia no longer rules the waves, you know, and we have to, in many areas, share our sovereignty with other people, which is what the European Union is ultimately about. So if I understand correctly your argument that uh, we don't want the European Union to become a nation state. No, I think, you know, the debate that is going on and which uh, David Cameron is trying to lead is, I think, there has been a tendency over the last 15 or 20 years for more and more decisions to be taken at a European level. Um, and the notion that one size fits all can be applied right across uh, what is now a union of 28 different countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that is mistaken, and we think that is mistaken. And in a whole range of areas, whether it be quite central areas like labour law, uh, areas like health and safety, and indeed areas uh, like conservation, you know, the way you uh, conserve your natural habitat, birds and all that. And we really do think that many of these competencies should be returned uh, to member states, mm. uh, because I think if you continue down the route where more and more things are centralised in Brussels, what you end up doing is undermining the whole concept of the nation state. After all, uh, and you have to be careful, I'm not saying these things are easy, uh, you have to be careful to ensure uh, that the four basic freedoms, which is what the European Union is based on, free movement of goods, people, capital and services uh, are not undermined by individuals, uh, individual nation states. Of course, you have to be very careful about that. But we were particularly uh, disappointed over the last 15 or 20 years. During the Maastricht Treaty, uh, the United Kingdom introduced the concept of subsidiarity, which essentially says that the first assumption should be that responsibility lies with member states and it should be uh, moved up to Brussels, if you like, uh, where that was necessary, but only where it was necessary. And I think the, that concept has not really worked. 
First of all, because the procedure for claiming subsidiarity is quite complex. And finally, the decision as to whether something should be agreed under subsidiarity is taken by the European Court of Justice and the Commission. Well, um, obviously you need to find a system where one individual nation can't block something that the other 27 think is worth doing. But by the same token, I don't think you can leave the decision in the hands, the final decision, in the hands of the European Court of Justice and the Commission, because it's pretty obvious which way they're going to be inclined. So, in your view, what would be the main reforms that should be undertaken within the European Union nowadays? Well, I think if we could get subsidiarity to work, uh, then everything else would flow from that. But, I mean, the example I gave during the talk is that since 1990, something like 3,600 new directives and uh, things have emerged from Brussels. Well, that's quite a lot over the last three years and all, all of them affecting in different ways the way individual businesses in the, com in the community operate. Mm -hmm. How would you define the role of the European uh, Union in the present international scenario? Well, I think it's a hugely important role because, I mean, to take uh, just one individual area, uh, the World Trade Organization, you know, we had the Uruguay round and now we're still uh, struggling with the, um, what's it called, the, with, with the Doha round. I mean, that is an area where no individual country in Europe would be able to exercise influence on its own. And of course, the procedure is lengthy, it's bureaucratic, it's very boring, but the decisions that come out of the WTO actually affect the standard of living of every single person living in Europe. And we're all best represented as the European Union than we would be as individual member states. As individual member states, we will be left sitting outside and the main negotiators these days, the United States, the uh, BRICS, and they would come out and they would tell us what the terms of, uh, of trade are going to be for the next 20 years. Well, I don't think that's a, a, a satisfactory position for any member state. So it's a very good example of how pooling sovereignty with our partners enables us to better defend both our interests and our values. Uh, talking about trade, uh, we've seen quite significant movements in the Latin America in that regard, especially the Pacific Alliance. Could you comment on that a bit? Well, I think the Pacific Alliance is hugely important and I think it presents uh, a very good opportunity for Spain, actually, because what is coming together there is Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, and possibly in the very short term, Panama and um, uh, Costa Rica, and it is essentially a common market. It's based on the four basic freedoms, mm -hmm. freedom of movement of goods, people, capital and services, and it is either the eighth or the seventh biggest economy in the world already. And interestingly, I think one of the reasons it's going to be very important in Latin America is the first time groups of countries have come together without any sort of political thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually, you know, most of the groups there, you have, to be, you have to be left or right or something in order to belong. Here, in the Pacific Alliance, you have to be, believe in free trade. Uh, and I think it's going to be, I think it's perhaps the most important thing to happen in Latin America in the last 50 or 60 years. Lord Gallo Jones, thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you very soon back at IE. Thank you for your, thank for you. your time. Thank, thank you. you.